funny. Hey guys, welcome to Not Another Fitness Podcast, a space dedicated to getting to know the person behind the whiteboard or for today's uh, special guest on the track, I believe. That is where the sport, yes, on the track. So I'm going to learn so much today. I'm excited. On today's show, uh, I have an athlete who competes in javelin throw. She has the Ameri- she's the American record holder in the javelin throw with a uh, distance of 66.67 meters. For those of us that don't know how, uh, how far that is, what the dis- distance that is, because I had to look it up myself, that's 218 feet with uh, eight and eight, 218 feet and then eight and three quarters. That is impressive. Um, she's been to the Pan Am Games a bunch of times. She's, she got a gold medal in 2019 in Lima, a silver in Toronto 2015. She has uh, podium 12 straight times at the U.S. Championships. So from 2008 to now. Um, and out of those, all those times, she's been first eight times. Um, not only that, but she's also been to the Olympics three times, which is impressive. Um, so without further ado, Kara Winger, welcome to the show. How are you Thank doing? Thank you, Martin. Yes, so happy to be here. I'm sorry to give you an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We were, uh, we were just having a conversation about, like, previous to the, to the podcast, how we we get some weird interruptions. So her her pup, her puppy was on the on the shot or in the shot, and then I told him the story about my parents' landline just blowing up when I was podcasting not so long ago. So, so um, that reminds me, I'll put my phone on silent. Yeah. I wonder if mine's on silent too. Oh, uh, it is on sleep mode now. <laughs> um, so how are you doing? Uh, we were talking a little bit about your injury. I, I don't. We might. We might. And this sounds like we might. But is it Torrent, Torrentino the thing where we go from from now to the to the past? But uh, how are you handling that? How's it going? How you been with this past year? That's been kind of crazy for everybody. Yeah, I tore my ACL for a second time um, on August first, twenty twenty, in the only competition I had for that season, um, and it was kind of it was just there's a lot of irony happening because i helped plan that meet i was like i want to throw one time in 2020 um and then to have a devastating injury uh as a result was you know no one's talked about that but sometimes i'm like is that embarrassing did i do that to myself this is terrible um but it's actually my second career acl tear um so the surgery at the end of august was a revision i had a hamstring cadaver graft um, instead of my own tissue the first time so the first time i did a patella bone patella bone um same knee because I was young enough that that was smart, um, but the injuries are separated by eight years. And so it's, oh, you know, wow. not possible to do your own tissue again from the same knee. And it's been a massively better experience to have someone else's tissue in my knee. So day by day, um, five months post-op right now. And yes. on that day, we were five months out from Olympic trials. Um, so having exactly 10 months to recover from okay. a surgery um, like that, is better especially because it's going so well so yeah One is, day uh, <laughs> are the not 2020 but are the olympics actually uh, gonna happen this year or are they gonna cancel them or postpone them well they've already been postponed right once yeah. um and what i keep telling people is a the idea that it would be canceled is very difficult for olympic athletes to contemplate um you know the everything we've been through in 2020 as a globe is really difficult and then on a kind of micro level the olympians in the world have been hanging on to that hope right so yeah. the rumors a couple of weeks ago that the olympics might be canceled away yeah. despite this one year postponement um were really hard to hear and the fact that you know my neighbor across the street yelled at me when i was on the dog park last week saying, Kara, are they going to be canceled? Like, that's kind of difficult to deal with because you imagine that it's, it's kind of like your, you know, yeah. end of, it's like an exit interview or something that then gets yeah. canceled and you don't get to uh, explain yourself or show what your value was in this company. Like, I try to think about like what it would be. It's basically like all of the Olympians in the world that are planning on the summer games are getting fired at the same time. And everyone's like, let's talk about it. <laughs> well, um, we're kind of devastated at that idea. So it's it's just an interesting question. But 
as far as I know, um, you know, I have the kind of benefit of being an Olympic and Paralympic training center athlete. So kind of being on the inside of the U.S. Yeah. Olympic movement um, and they're all full steam ahead. So I just have to rely on that kind of that information instead okay. of whatever is in the news media. Okay. Uh, so next question, did you invest in GameStop or? Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's actually, I, I probably should have because I happened to come into some inheritance money. Oh, recently. there you go. <laughs> yeah, my, my, uh, my grandpa unfortunately passed away from COVID in the fall, but um, oh, left uh, my brother and I some money. So I definitely could have. I just was not <laughs> on the internet that day, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Some guy, I think some, some guy invested, my brother was telling me about it. Some guy invested $70,000 and he's sitting on $50 million, I think right now. And he hasn't mm-hmm. sold. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, insane. I love that. I really enjoy the memes. I think it's really fun. So. Oh, they're, they're great. They, they made these videos where, um, uh, like war scenes of like certain movies, like 300. And like, there's like the general going in front of his troops and just like giving them like, you know, like that pep talk. And like, they start labeling everybody like a different person. And they're like, just hold on to your, to your things. Don't, don't sell. So I'm having a lot of fun watching that, especially because I, I only invested 20 bucks. So like, I don't really care what happens. <laughs> well, good for you though. You're part yeah. of it. That's great. I know. Yeah. I'm like, I just want to know what happens. <laughs> Um, have you guys, uh, speaking of COVID, have you guys been affected by COVID at all? Like, have, do you think you ever, do you think you got COVID at any point in the last No, um, so okay. because of being a training center athlete, like all of 2020, I was just at home, training at home. I bought okay. a Soranex um, off-grid rack and I put it on my deck. You know, my mm-hmm. husband's handy enough that like, he also built me um, parallettes like for gymnastics. So I have Sweet. like just really fun, interesting tools that like I okay. didn't have before COVID. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did all summer. And then when I hurt my knee again, um, you know, I hadn't planned on going back to the center when they first opened again, because like truly that training facility was closed all year, all of like from March to like September, basically. Um, and I was like on the list re-entered into like the the bubble of that training center mm. um and wasn't going to because i was like it's going to be off season i won't be like training but then i was forced to go back because of my knee so um i've been tested i think three times now Got it. um once to well and twice <laughs> each time so really six um <laughs> so for the first time to like get back in and they they tested athletes then if they had um antibodies they would test like put them through more like heart and lung um kind of monitoring to okay. see like, what the long term term effects of like when they had the virus would be just to wow. keep athletes safe and then uh i fill out symptom surveys twice a day on the internet um to be able to go back uh, wow. <laughs> you take kind of an I can't remember if it was written or not, but like this oath to, you know, protect yourself and the community. Yeah. If you travel, um, there's a quarantine protocol to kind of get back into the system. So um, honestly, it's been kind of more of a grind than 2020 even was to just like stay home, stay safe, make sure that I'm like healthy to go to my rehab every day. Um, and goal in mind is really important to kind of keep that up, that discipline. Um, yeah. And I self-reported a symptom once okay. just for throat really from like weather change, I think. Um, okay. But immediately they're like, okay, you got to get tested again and stay home for a couple of days before you can come back into the system just so everybody stays healthy. Yeah, so that's... no, I have not had COVID. No one super close to me except for my grandpa has had um, that I know of. So. Okay. Well, that, that's good. My, like pretty much like my entire family, I think five or six out of us, so it's, it's a total of seven people. Um, uh, two, three sisters and and my, a brother, myself and my two parents, uh, we tested positive on like December 25th or something. So it was an interesting Christmas for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it was nothing like it was nothing, nothing terrible. We were just like, I was just tired for a couple of days. Um, and then my breathing, I guess, was the thing that was mostly affected. I, if I were to walk up like a flight of stairs, I was like passing out, but yeah, that's what I've heard. A couple of athletes um, that are now back on campus did have it. And, uh, you know, even they're Olympic athletes, like some of yeah. them medalists and had a really difficult time, like with the symptoms. So it just, yeah. it doesn't matter who you are. Like it affects yeah. everybody totally differently. And 
Um, that's pretty scary, but I, I'm a homebody. Like I've, I honestly loved summer 2020. I had, um, one of my best world, like living with me and we trained together and it was super fun. So, um, kind of took advantage of the extra time with just yeah. people that I love, um, including my husband. We like camped more than we would normally get to in a summer. And yeah, even now, like since I have all this new equipment and I kind of unlocked some areas in my home that it like didn't really get used before. But since I live here, I work here, I train here. I just like, I love my house even more. And there's so much you can accomplish in one little tiny plot of land. I, I agree. I'm like, I'm a homebody myself. And I'm like, I just, I want to stay home. Like <laughs> lockdown isn't that bad. I mean, I feel, I feel like it's bad because like of a lot of companies and all the businesses, like just, I mean, you know, losing a bunch of money and all that stuff, but I'm right. Like, no, and I totally recognize like my privilege in saying that and like how lucky I have been throughout the, the pandemic yeah. um, to, you know, honestly have more income than I normally would because I got a job. I'm like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really wild, like the kind of inverse relationship to the pandemic um, that I sort of have, despite injury or no injury. But yeah, that being said, it's, it's all a lot of change that I yeah. didn't see coming in kind of both directions. And so, um, yeah, adjustment has been like difficult, but it's getting, it's getting better, it's getting easier. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see like a couple of years from now, um, like just different people's perspectives, because my perspective of COVID, you know, like knock on wood, wasn't totally terrible. I got to see my parents more than ever because like I'm living in Northern California for like the past few years now. My parents are in SoCal. So um, like I get to see them every day. Uh, yeah, like we got sick. But then again, like when they got sick, their symptoms weren't so terrible to where, you know, like something bad, really bad happened to them. Right. Um, so it hasn't, it, it hasn't been a terrible year. I, like, again, I'm lucky to be able to do my job. We went completely virtual. So um, I'm lucky to still have my job. And yeah, it's just going to be interesting to see different people's perspectives where, uh, you know, they did lose their job or they did lose loved ones. And um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but hopefully to, we're, we're, we're doing better. It seems like a good start to 2021 so far. Yeah. So you've been to three Olympics. I know it's going to be hard to choose uh, your favorite one, but which was your favorite one out of the three that you've been to and why? Rio, 2016. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the biggest reasons is that that was the first ever Olympics in South America. Okay. And that was really special to me. Like Beijing 2008 was so massive. Like a lot of people, you know, remember that opening ceremony and it was just the, the most spectacular, overwhelming, like very cool first Olympic experience. But in terms of being ready for that, I was not. I was 22, I was not, you know, I'd thrown over 60 meters one time in my entire career, and that was like to throw the standard to make the team. Um, so in terms of like being prepared to perform in that really high, like pressure, overwhelming, very glamorous, like grandeur of the Olympics, I was just, it was too much. Um, so I loved it, but just in terms of like total overall experience, uh, yeah. Yeah. Then London was kind of similar, like London is London. So they, they have the funds to make it again, like spectacular and yeah. grand and kind of, you could really tell like the revitalization of like the Olympic village area and the stadium and like that whole kind of area of London. Um, that one was really fun because you could like walk from the village to the track. Um, so through this mall and kind of get the whole experience the, the day of my qualifying round, um, <clears throat> It competed on a torn ACL like that was my first injury in London oh wow I just knew that it was not gonna be spectacular and that made that Olympics really hard but okay. one of my like most vivid memories is walking back to the village after my competition mm -hmm. um and being in pain and being you know disappointed and having zero control over mm -hmm. like how my leg felt uh and then there was this puppy and I got to like sit on the mall floor and like pet this puppy and I was just crying and petting a stranger's puppy and just like the most strange experience though it was good overall my family was there and all that stuff but Rio was very cool for like the community's appreciation of the event I was on the subway one time and when it went past the point that it used to go to to get to the Olympic like area of the city 
every like every Brazilian person on the train started clapping. Like there was this massive celebration oh, about wow. like changing infrastructure, and it was just yeah. like really it was really different than either of the other Olympics. Um, plus, <laughs> like it just it felt like smaller, more intimate. There was just okay. Um, I don't know, this really cool feel about it. And despite missing the final by one spot, uh, I just loved uh, the whole experience. <laughs> so so uh, that Beijing experience, what, what would you say was the most like, I guess like impressive or eye-opening thing of like you walking out to the, you walking out to compete? Did, like, like, what does that feel like? Because like, I'm never gonna go to the Olympics, um, but like, like what what is that like like you're you're there uh it's your first time at the olympics you want to perform like what's it like it's kind of like i mean in beijing specifically for me um it it's like a movie when it's kind of slow motion but oh, also the lights are like blurry you yeah know what I mean? yeah like, like that's exactly the the feeling that i had walking out and the beijing the bird's nest if you've never been there like pictures don't even tell you how big it is like it's it's insane i have a picture from outside the stadium uh it was raining uh -huh. and just the people times though the people their shadows and stuff like from the lights of the stadium were like long but just seeing how tiny 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 they were compared to the massive like three-story bird's nest um, I can't remember how many people it holds, but if you sat in that third tier of seating in the stadium, it's just, it's the biggest place I've ever been. Uh, oh. So for that to be my first Olympics, like was extremely intimidating. And that, um, <laughs> that movie like reference, like with the blurred lights, like that's yeah. exactly how I feel walking out there. <laughs> where, where, did your parents go with you to any of the Olympics? Like did, were they ever did, yeah. All three, yep. They're, oh, wow. They're incredible, yep. That's, that's so awesome. I mean, I mean, I can, I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine what it's like to like see your, your son or daughter walk out there and just get ready to compete. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think I would cry. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Like <laughs> I would cry, but like, seeing my little kid walk out there with their javelin or whatever, it, whatever sport it is they're playing, right. Or, or they're competing in. I just, I would just like, I don't know what, I, I don't know what I would do, honestly. <laughs> Well, in, in Beijing, especially like, this is one of the things that made it more palatable is like, I saw them. I didn't know where they were sitting. I didn't know, like, and I wasn't necessarily looking for them, but it was one of those moments when uh, we like entered the stadium on one end and we had to walk yeah. all the way to the other end to get to the javelin runway. Um, and I just looked up and like, there's my mom and dad. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're so excited that I'm seeing yeah. them, but I'm so excited that I'm seeing them. And it was just, um, it was a very cool thing. So they're incredible. They just bought their tickets for Tokyo uh, last weekend. Okay. The first time I made the Olympic team, they purchased tickets and like event tickets and all that stuff, like before I made the team, because it looked pretty good that I was going to do it. But they didn't tell me about it. So like right after uh -huh. I won Olympic trials in 08, they were like, we're coming to this very <laughs> exciting moment. But ever since then, they've been really honest, like, yeah, we're come, like we're going. So hopefully you <laughs> also come. And uh, Tokyo is no different. So it's hilarious and That's... very encouraging. You know, despite my injury, like they're still um, making the effort. So That's awesome. I think I'm actually wearing a, a what is it? A, a get your gold? Yeah, I'm getting a get your gold shirt. Uh, so I work for Exos, and we're contracted through Intel. So Intel was one of the big, or is still one of the big sponsors for the for the Olympics. And actually at the beginning of last year or at the end of 2019, I think, we actually had some Olympic athletes go, go on campus. I wasn't able to participate in that event because I had classes and I had other things going on. But um, yeah, we got a bunch of these shirts. I was pretty stoked. I was like, oh, sweet. Like Intel's going to like uh, sponsor this. And I don't know, like we might get some insight of what's going on because they were developing some technology for, I mean, just to, to make everything, I guess, more fair because like, I feel as as we progress as a society, like the the gaps are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So we need more technology to to be able to determine like those what is it those finishes? I can't think of what it's called. Those picture line finishes? No, photo photo finish photo, photo finishes. Finish, yeah. Yes, there you go. So uh, yeah, so it was pre is a pretty interesting time. So I wonder how they're I wonder how they're handling all of this. But fingers crossed to Tokyo twenty twenty one happening because then we'd have to wait till twenty twenty four. Right, 2020. Correct. Yeah. In LA? 
Uh, that one's Paris. Oh, LA Paris. 28. Yeah. 2028. Uh, are you planning on competing in Paris? No. Okay. Do you see yourself becoming a coach and maybe going to Paris as a coach? Um, I mean, that that's like, there's a very small chance that that could happen. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, my, my retirement plan has always been uh, world championships in Eugene. And so that was originally 2021. Got it. Okay. Now it's 2022 because of the Olympic postponement. So they postponed worlds uh, one year as well. Okay. So, so, oh, oh, well, okay. Sweet. Eugene, and, and that's a university of Oregon, I assume, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Of course. So we got a bunch of um, up-to-date information, but now I think I want to take it back and just kind of learn what your path was into becoming an Olympic athlete. Um, so would you mind sharing your story with us? Sure. Yeah. Sweet. You want me to just jump in? Just jump in. It's, it's cool. your podcast now. You, you so, <laughs> I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> um, so I, one of the reasons that 2021, as soon as that world was announced, I was like, perfect. That would be exactly 20 years um, since I started throwing the javelin. So my freshman year of high school, was 2001. Um, I had my first ever competition on my 15th birthday um, and I had not gone out for the team like quite early enough. I, I didn't know what sport I wanted to play in the spring because I'd always played softball. When I tried track in eighth grade, I didn't have javelin in middle school. So I didn't like discover my event <laughs> in my first <laughs> Uh, and then I tried a bunch of stuff, but I remember very distinctly my basketball coach laughing when I told him that I was a high jumper. So oh. yeah, <laughs> in terms of like athletic prowess, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> my effort has always been like my strong point, my most, okay. uh, yeah, my biggest advantage in the athletic realm rather than any physical um, attribute. <laughs> so yeah, freshman year, I went out for the team late, which meant I was on day B, like, to start my competitive season, um, and I threw, like, 107 feet, which would have won the varsity, and it just surprised everybody. Like, I remember my dad's face very distinctly, yeah. um, and from there, um, broke the school record. Freshman year, I got second in state with, like, a 15-foot PR at state, um, and then I won the next three years, the state championship. Oh, damn. it was crazy. Yeah. And I had always considered myself a basketball player, like probably told me junior year of high school. I was like, okay. I'm a basketball player. <laughs> and then I finally, when it came, came time for college recruiting, was like, okay, I'm probably a javelin thrower. Like this is where <laughs> lies. Um, and I also just loved the individual component of it. I swam in the fall and to have like that satisfaction of like the effort that I put in creating mm. Uh, performance individually was really great and swimming I had tapped into that a little bit but like swimming's the hardest sport I ever did so as far as you know performance it just wasn't quite there because okay. I'm not an endurance athlete and there's a component of endurance to every <laughs> event in swimming um <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know how to swim so uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know <laughs> it looks really hard so <laughs> I, I do have to learn my husband uh Russ he learned after he retired from sport swimming okay. as a bigger guy like his joints were just not happy and it's super fun to be able to swim laps together now okay. it sucks okay. to learn it's really hard but okay. um once you get the hang of it it's very very good exercise Excellent. i just don't i don't want to get water in my ears <laughs> <laughs> and i feel like that would happen for sure <laughs> so that's the one thing i'm scared of and drowning like i don't want to drown oh, yeah it's a good call yep. yeah very, yeah <laughs> super relatable <laughs> Um, yeah, so then uh, I got recruited to like four different schools, but I picked Purdue. I loved the people. My coach was amazing. Rodney Zuderwick, he's now at um, Notre Dame. Oh. And had a fantastic, like difficult college experience full of change. I changed my major like four times. Um, <laughs> my teammates were wonderful. The only season I've missed, knock on wood, so far is 2007 um, due to a lumbar stress fracture. And that was kind of the beginning of my injury journey in a major way. I broke my arm freshman year and I had to like 
rehab from that as well, but um, <laughs> it was less major than the back injury. Uh, okay. Really where I learned like how important rehab details are and how much they can benefit you um, in a season. So core especially was, you know, something I had always done, but I just like understood it better after the back mm. injury. And it really propelled me into um, 2008, my redshirt junior year, which is when I made the Olympic team and finally made the NCAA final. Um, and I had really struggled at the majors like before that back injury okay. in college. And then um, afterward, just kind of having those secret weapons of rehab in my back pocket, like made me a lot more confident in the high pressure situations. Um, yeah. And here we are today. Uh, like a very long time later after <laughs> college, still throwing the javelin. So I, I, I don't, I don't know a lot about the sport. Um, first of all, wh why did you, why did you choose the javelin? I, I guess that's, that's my question. Like what, what drew you to the javelin, uh, to that event in specific? My geometry teacher, my uh -huh. freshman year of high school, Ron Heidenreich, he said to me in class, he was, he was the head girls track coach. And he said, Kara, you should throw the javelin. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um sure i'll try it because again i didn't have anything lined up i had like thought yeah. about being a golfer um okay. i thought about taking that spring season uh, my freshman year off i had like my entire childhood played sports all the time so i was like well maybe i just should just rest and then a week into that i was like no i should play a sport because i'm really bored um so his suggestion like stuck with me and went out for the team late and I didn't really have another direction to turn. Cause again, I hadn't loved anything else. Okay. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say it was like instantly <laughs> phenomenal. Like it was once I got to a competition, but I really don't remember my first couple practices. Like I, I didn't have really an instant connection. It was just something new. Um, and I, that's what I loved about it again, like the ability to put individual effort into something and see your own outcome. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I felt a lot of pressure in all sports, like until that point for no reason other than I just wanted to do well. Yeah. So this was like the first time yeah. that it was a community where there really wasn't anything on the line. And I, I had really chosen it just to do something mm -hmm. with my friends. And, um, it ended up that it was where I was supposed to be. So very weird. Did, did you ever call your basketball coach back to, to make fun of, to make fun of him or her to, because you made it to the Olympics? Well, and as I'm not a high jumper, no, <laughs> like he was, he was absolutely right. Um, Dave Bennett and we're, we, we still communicate a little okay. bit. Um, he got me connected with uh, the Washington inter intercollegiate. No, Okay. Interscholastic Athletics Association, WIAA, like the Washington high school system Got for it. like a couple of different um, promotional things during COVID to like encourage okay. kids. Like, yeah. So he still got my back in a lot of okay. ways. That was like very true um, and good natured. Rip yeah, I would have, I would have, I would have called them back and be like, you know what? Like I am not a good high jumper, but I made it to the Olympics throwing javelin. And that would have been that, but then I probably would have lost his friendship. So I think you made the right call. <laughs> and he, he knows, right? He's, okay. he's very supportive. It's yeah, fun. no. Yeah, no, uh, it's crazy how like some of those coaches are very influential, like early on in, in your life or in your career. And uh, it's, it's those people that like, where, if you ever make it somewhere, where, wherever it is that you want to make or if you feel like you made it somewhere, they always have your back, right? It's th those are the people with the, uh, I guess like, least interest for themselves they're like just very giving people um so it's always wonderful to have those people in your corner like i'm just super lucky to have uh joel gunterman he was my strength coach at uh at toc commu uh, the community college i went to mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then i interned for him and like now he's like he's one of my best friends and he's my mentor and it's like he's always somebody that you can call and um he would just he'll just help you out and i like i know he's gonna be my friend forever so that's that's pretty pretty awesome yeah, I feel super lucky. I think um, that's partly Olympic sport versus like super mainstream, mm -hmm. you know, uh, American sport uh, yeah. that all of my coaching relationships 
and you know even teammates and and stuff like that like they're so multifaceted like they're not just coach athlete relationships like yeah. it's just it's all about your entire life and how um you know everything that you bring to the table personality wise and all that stuff like is just going to help you as an athlete um and to maintain those relationships because like why wouldn't you there's no <laughs> there's no reason um to stay connected in this fabulous community of people that like helped you get where you were so that, or where you are that that's that's true um, going back to this whole idea that I, I don't know much about the, 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 the javelin, javelin throw as a sport, what does uh, a season look like in terms of training? Because um, I, I know they're, they're, I'm sure there's like a peaking phase or, or something that's kind of like a peaking phase, but what does like, how do you, how do you prep for that? What, what is the season, what's the season plan look like? As you are probably aware, training changes over time. So the way that I train now is very different from how I used to train. Okay. And that really means that like even my training season is a lot shorter than other people's seem to be in track and field, in the throws. Um, I usually, in a season that I'm not injured, uh, start doing some like endurance stuff like training based bodybuilding kinds of things in oh. like end of November, like mid November, end of November. Um, and then move through December like that <laughs> January and February are a lot of throwing volume and like heavier thing. So still like training based kinds of stuff. Um, then once you get to like March, April, you start to, you know, drop the volume, pick up the intensity a little bit to like test positions that you've been working on um, technically. And then May, June, like begins the competitive season. So um, training from that point on really depends on where you are in the world, um, the competitions you're going to, timing of those competitions. And yeah, the amount of sleep you get if you're internationally traveling, like stuff like that. So um, you definitely try to cater training to the biggest meets right but yeah. like i'm not somebody that has ever done well with a real like deload for a big competition so my stuff is pretty consistent um for most of the season like there's i'm not the most explosive athlete so like there are a couple things that i need to do to feel like primed and ready to be that way in a competition Got it. um but over the last few years, especially, it's become pretty clear um, that we can turn that around really quickly. So if I'm not feeling good, I can just communicate with coach um, Jamie Myers in Chula Vista, California, um, and talk about, um, you know, just adding a set of box jumps truly, like, can really make me feel like an athlete again <laughs> okay. and ready okay. for a competition. So, yeah. You said coach Jamie Myers? Mm-hmm. Hi, Coach. I hope you listen to this and you hear how cool your athlete is. Um, he might. I don't know. Jamie is my, <laughs> the longest, the person who has coached me the longest out of any sport I've ever done. So he's been my strength coach since 2009 um, and became the person who writes all of my programming awesome. uh, at the end of 2017. So since like 2018 season, um, he and I like write all of my stuff and it's, it's super fun super fun that's that's so cool um you've placed first eight times like wh what is that like does it ever get any less cool or, or i i know they're all great like i understand that winning is awesome right it's like i think as competitors we're, we're out there to win like even though we're always like oh it's not about the win but like we we train to win uh, um but there's more there, there's a bunch of learning that goes on when you don't win etc cetera, etc cetera. um but do they ever get less special? Like, I mean, out of the 12 times that you competed in the U.S. championships, you've placed first eight times out of 12. What the heck? Did, like, wow. Uh, no. No is the answer. Um, I always want to win nationals. It's pretty important to me. Uh However, like it's, it's gotten harder in recent years, which is really cool. Like that's yeah. what I like and that's what makes it still really cool to win um, because we have more talent in the U S than we used to. Um, so the competition is just, it's better at national championships. Yeah. And that means to win is like more meaningful because you're beating people that can throw further. Um, yeah. I, my first 
three uh, were super special. 2008 was Olympic trials. And I had, I would have made the Olympic team anyway, kind of, um, but to win the trials was really important to me. It was also at the time, like not far enough, but an Olympic trials record. Like it shouldn't have been, someone should have thrown further than that before that, but I set the Olympic trials record, which was cool. Um, and then 2009, I had the most inconsistent series of my life. <laughs> But on my fifth row, I had a massive PR, 63.95. And at the time, the American record was 64.19. Oh, damn. Uh, so threaten that was very cool <laughs> in a time when I was like brand new out of college, like pretty my future. Like I just, I was alone at nationals for the first time. And to have that happen was very cool and reassuring. And then 2010 was when I broke the American record. Um, and that was the series of my life, like super really good throws, all of them. So um, those three first national championships will always stand out in my mind. So 2010, um, you just said you broke the record. What, like, what did that feel like? And did you do anything different to prep? I mean, it sounds like you've been completely consistent, um, obviously with the evolving science that we have, like, I assume your training has gotten better and better and smarter, but like, how, like, I mean, besides awesome, how did it feel to get that world record <laughs> or yeah, the American record? American record. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people say world record. And I think that's yeah. just an Americanism. Like they assume that the American record is the world yes. record. Totally not. Yeah. Like um, the world series. <laughs> and it's just. Right. Yes, right. world champion. No, yeah, it's like, it's no, that. you're American champion. <laughs> yeah, and in the javelin, like, the, the worldview that it's given me is very cool because the world record is 72-28. Wow. Yeah, like, 66-67 in the global scheme of things. Like, used to be top 20 all time, yeah. but I don't think it is anymore. I think it's, like, 23 or 24. Um, so, in terms of, yeah, global performance, like, it's pretty good, but it's not what Americans expect it to be. And I love having that perspective, like, as an American going yeah. out into the world um, and recognizing the talent that is other places. It's really fun. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So, 2010, <laughs> you... <laughs> You break the American record, not the world record. Um, the American record, the, what, was 2010 like, was it one of those, like, I guess, perfect seasons where like everything went right and then leading up to that competition, you were just like primed and just ready to go? Yes. Um, 2010, like 2009, the fall into the 2010 season was my first full professional season. So I graduated spring 09 and then moved to Chula Vista, California. Um, and full-time professional javelin thrower for the first time so like truly that was the biggest difference like I actually slept um I ate three square meals a day I had you know two a days for most of the year um yeah. and, and had a new coach that knew just more about the javelin so um you know looking back like it felt like such a surprise that it was so successful and so consistent all year um, however, like now that I know myself, like it shouldn't have been as much of a surprise. I think I was just inconsistent enough in college that nobody really knew what to expect from me as a professional, including myself. Um, but with the consistency of training and just a little bit better knowledge of the sport of the event, uh, or, you know, we're really fun. And especially <laughs> because I didn't necessarily expect them. Um, but knowing what I know about myself now, like that, yeah, for sure. Like becoming a <laughs> professional javelin thrower was going to result in that cool season. Um, but I did have difficulty still. I had a, um, I sprained a facet in my like thoracic lumbar junction. So like I couldn't extend my back for like two months, um, which was terrible. And I think I, as me like overtrained quite a bit because I was in that new situation. So to have that forced rest period was really important for that season. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of really awesome things about 2010, uh, but I kind of touched on before, like in, in terms of how my training goes throughout a season, um, my old coach really believed in like the tapering thing mm -hmm. as athletes and you know, no one could have known that that wouldn't work for me. Like it wasn't, 
we'd never worked together before. So there was no way to predict that I would fall off at the end of the season. But some of my biggest disappointments about 2010 were that I just, I couldn't hold on to fitness throughout mm. the year. So like yeah. I did fantastic. I, I loved like the whole experience of it, but when it came to the most important meet, meets at the end of the season, I just didn't have it anymore. So um, I think focusing on that more long-term plan, like could have set me up better for my entire career. I have struggled to like learn those lessons ever since. And um, there are still so many positive things to take away. Uh, one of the coolest things about the American record day was that I missed the bus to the track. <laughs> and I had this like forced adrenaline rush, like in, in how to figure out how to get there because yeah. like Uber did not exist yet. Um, I didn't know how to call a taxi. I was like 23, <laughs> but I've never had to do that. Uh, and I, I saw this couple in the parking lot who had also missed the bus and okay. they were like talking to each other, like, Oh, well, should we just drive? And I was like, Hey, hello, <laughs> I need a ride as well. So like, let's go right now. Let's do this. And, um, Kurt and Sylvia Grudbacher, uh, I saw Kurt again at nationals in 2019 at the same track, um, in Des Moines, Iowa. So they gave me a ride. We found great parking. Uh, I checked in no problem. And they came and watched me break the American record. So I've had those moments throughout my career that like I'm forced to get out of my own head mm. and it results in something really great. So for me, like that's a very significant event that happened that day. Great shape. I had thrown pretty far like before nationals, but to kind of shake myself loose, I needed something like that to happen to then go and be relaxed. at the yeah. Okay. Well, it's good. Like the pre-stressor before the, the stress, you just got yeah. it out of your way. Where, so where, where is javelin? Like what country dominates the javelin throw? Um, <clears throat> it depends on the year, kind of. Okay. Uh, both world record holders in both genders, both men and women are from the Czech Republic. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, it, yeah. And those, both of those are, are pretty, they're very old. So the men's world record is from 1998 and the women's is from 2008, but Barbara wow. is still actively throwing uh, the women's world record holder. And then in recent years, there have been some good Chinese girls. Um, my friend Kelsey and she won the world championship in 2019. Um, German throwers are very good on the men's side and the women's side historically like for a very long time they've been really good so yeah mostly european but australians are also fantastic okay but and chinese people that's mm -hmm. i need to yeah i need to look more into the into this whole into this whole sport um i i looked at some of your videos when you're throwing the javelin <clears throat> it's extremely technical like there, there's just no way around it what was the like what was the the hardest thing to learn to, to get like, was it, was there like a certain thing that was very difficult for you to get down? Because it's not just the, the idea of throwing it or like people might see it and it's like, Oh, they're just throwing the javelin. And it's like, when you look at it more from like a, like a performance perspective or a, or a coaching perspective, you're like, dude, there's so much going on there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You are a human bow and arrow, basically like a human slingshot. And for me, like I was always really good at running fast and stopping. Like my block leg has always been really strong <laughs> until I tore my ACL the first time. And then I struggled and, you know, we'll see what happens moving forward. But uh, I was always pretty fearless about that. Um, so that wasn't an issue, but that kind of turned into uh, impatience. So what you don't see if you don't really know about the javelin is like the role of the right leg. Mm -hmm. If you're right, you're sprinting down the runway, you turn sideways, you do your crossovers, and then you stop on your left leg. Mm -hmm. But people forget about your right leg, especially when you're learning. So what I always did was like paw that right foot backwards. Mm -hmm. Like I'm impatient with my right side at the end of the throw. So what that does is like push you forward onto your block and your upper body like pitches forward as well, okay. which puts a lot of stress on your back and a lot of stress on your shoulder. Um, and doesn't allow you to like build tension behind the block, mm -hmm. which 
increased speed at release and increased distance. So for me, patience in, in a word is like the hardest thing to okay. learn. Um, and that is like, that starts for me with the right foot, but continues <clears throat> into like the left shoulder staying closed, which keeps your right hand back really far um, and allows you to build that tension. So um, it, it is very technical <laughs> and learning the patience of the right side particularly has been pretty difficult for me, but we're getting there. And at the same time, as I changed um, from Jamie being my strength coach to my full-time programmer, I got a new technical coach, Dana mm -hmm. Lyon of the US Air Force Academy. And she has been phenomenal in helping me learn that because at five foot two, she has much different tools than I do at six feet tall. And yeah. she was a two-time NCAA champion, um, still top 10 all time in the US uh, javelin thrower at Air Force. So she knows how to get everything out of her little tiny body. And she's teaching me how to do that as a six foot tall person. She's been <laughs> fantastic, yeah. So. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. Like, d does it pay to be taller versus does it pay to be short? It might be a dumb question, but. Um, what like are, are on average are javelin throwers a little bit taller? I would say yes. Okay. Um, however, there are many different. Yes, I am back. Okay, so I paused it. We we stopped when you started explaining. <laughs> Does it pay to be taller on average? I'm sorry. Cool. Um, but we're recording again. Um, would you mind, I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that one more time? Not at all. Uh, okay. I can do, do it even better. Sweet. Uh, yes, it pays to be taller theoretically in the javelin, but okay. there are many different body types. And one of the things that I think shorter people have uh, an advantage in is having less time to make mistakes. So their like pull is shorter, like their yeah. arm is shorter probably, but they're gonna be a lot more efficient in their movements because mm -hmm. their levers are smaller. Yeah. And that results in just like more power, more like- Just like a snap, right? Just boom. Yeah, like explosiveness. Mm -hmm. And you know, possibly the gains that they make in the weight room because they're not moving weight as far and stuff like that is like where the balance comes in. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, they're, ev everybody can throw the javelin. There are so many different kinds of people. It's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. I, I want to throw the javelin now. I need to get my hands on one. I don't know where I'm going to get one, but I might go to one of the schools here and see if they have a javelin. I want to, I want to try throwing one. Um, I encourage I will. And then uh, I'll ask you to be my technical coach. <laughs> so you can, I'll send you videos constantly. Am I doing this right? <laughs> people do that. So <clears throat> Okay. Well, mm -hmm. What, um, one of the last questions, and then I guess, um, I guess we're, we're out of here or we're done with this. Is there anything, first of all, that you'd want to say to your, um, to your younger self and then on that, like, kind of like question and then like, um, option a or extension a, is there anything you, you would want to say to those, um, younger athletes aspiring to participate or not to participate, I'm sorry, to, to compete in javelin, um, Stuff that you would have maybe liked to know, uh, like to know as a as a younger as a younger athlete. In the javelin specifically. Yeah. <clears throat> or let's make I, it. Oh. Go ahead. No, no, no. no. I was gonna say let's make it a little bit broader. Maybe to somebody who's aspiring to make it to the Olympics, if that's a bit easier for you to answer. Oh, that's harder. No. Okay. Okay. Let's, um, let's bring it back. I, <laughs> we'll bring it back. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, I think that I did a lot of things well that I didn't realize that okay. I did. So that's what I'm actually coaching an athlete now um, at the Air Force Academy prep school. So he's like just a first like quote unquote collegiate year. Um, it's kind of like a junior college, but it's really fun to put myself back in that place and like, remember what I did well. And part of that is like shoulder flexibility, which I had naturally, but like being able to think about how to pull the javelin with my armpit more than like with the rest of my arm. 
and that's yeah. very specific to javelin so like yeah. that's just like a tiny detail that i didn't mean to it really helped me yeah use the rest of my body rather than like just you know throwing it like a dart which a lot of people do mm-hmm. um yeah and then core do all of the core all of it all the time core that's how you connect your legs to your arms and throw the javelin bar yeah. um yeah but also like there's such an advantage for kids now with like YouTube and Instagram and and TikTok and like being connected to the community of the javelin on a global scale that I did not have. So I would say like continue to take advantage of that. They are like, they're already doing that, but I just think it's such a cool thing to recognize talent in the world. Like I, not until I went to junior nationals, my like sophomore year of high school and saw a fellow Washingtonian, uh, Erica Wheeler, win national championships. Yeah. Was I like, I could do that. Like, that would be really cool. And so just the visibility of role models on the internet um, in the Javelin is very cool to me and something that people are super naturally taking advantage of, um, but that I just would encourage to keep happening because it's really neat to see the community grow in that way. Yeah, for sure. The, the internet is changing our world. My, my brother and I were just talking about it last night. We usually go on walks every night and um, we're like, dude, like the whole, I, I mean, not, not related to sport, but like more so related to the whole like um, stock thing that's going on right now. We're like yeah. that, that wouldn't have been possible like five, six years ago, maybe t- 10 years ago, if we want to go that, that far. Um, like the internet is really changing our world. And I think it's a, it's a good, it's a great tool when um you know when you see the best to the best of your advantage because like now i have so much information in my hand or in my pocket at, at all times that like i'm just surprised sometimes that we're like we're not using it for the right reasons or to the best of our to the best of our advantages so um so yeah like it's like now we're all more connected so um for instance you like you were very nice i reached out and and you replied and and like that's why i tell people all the time i'm like dude like if you want to learn something from like somebody that you look up to or, you know, somebody, somebody that you respect, just reach out to them. Um, worst thing is going to happen is they're not going to answer because they get a bunch of DMS or emails, but then just try again a couple months later. It, it doesn't hurt to reach out. So on, on that note, I do want to thank you for, yep. for participating on, on my podcast. Um, it means a lot. I have learned a lot about javelin throw that I didn't know before. Um, and I'm just, I'm just looking forward to learning more about, about this, the sport in itself and and hopefully see you compete in tokyo 2021 thank you so much yeah fingers crossed yes yes that that would be in five months right five five five-ish months five six um the olympic trials are in five-ish okay okay um olympics i believe the new dates are like july 26th to something late july early august yep it's gonna happen your i mean your parents already have tickets so the Olympics I mean, need to probably happen. Probably they got <laughs> refundable ones after their experience in 2020, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. They didn't disclose that information. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. I'm always happy to talk about the javelin and my journey, and um, I get so much more out of it than just being an athlete. So that's my true message. Yes. Uh, again, thank you so much. If you guys are interested about learning more about the javelin, would you mind sharing your Instagram with us so everybody sure. can? Sure. Yeah, most of my social medias are at Kara Throws Jav um, or Javelin. Um, I think on TikTok, I'm just Kara Winger, but I never TikTok, so don't even go there. Yeah, Instagram is my forte, at Kara Throws Jav. There you go. If you guys have any questions, uh, reach out to her on Instagram. I will tag her on this on the podcast whenever I post it in my story. Um, or if you guys want to find her, want to, I'm going to make finding her way easier. Here, let me get my thoughts together. I'm, I'm going to follow her right now as soon as I'm done recording this. And then you guys can just go into my friends and the people that I'm following. And you can just search Kara, K-A-R-A, and she's going to pop up right there. And it'll be easy to find her now, okay? Um, thank you. Thank you again for being on my show. Uh, thank you guys for listening in on this. Uh, Have a great weekend. I'm going to stop recording because I need to get some information from Kara so I can send him some Regent coffee from Glendale, California. So I'm not sponsored by them, but I do want to uh, 
give them a shout out because they do have great coffee. So um, <laughs> Kara's happy. She's, she's fist pumping. If you guys are listening on this, she's like, I've fist only pump. had one cup today. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening in um, to Not Another Fitness Podcast, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.